First Chronicles chapter 13, and we'll start at verse 1. I just want to give context to where we're uh, jumping into this story. David has just become king of all Israel. Of course, he was king of Judah, but now he has been, he's become king of all Israel. And we just break into this story at that exciting moment, probably one of the most exciting moments in Israel's history. Because now David, a righteous king, is taken over from a wicked king, Saul. First Chronicles chapter 13, verse 1. And David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds and with every leader. And David said unto all the congregation of Israel, If it seem good unto you, and that it be of the Lord our God, let us send abroad unto our brethren everywhere, that are left in all the land of Israel, and with them also to the priests and Levites, which are in their cities and suburbs, that they may gather themselves unto us. And let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. And all the congregation said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Verse 8. And David and all Israel pled before God with all their might, with singing and with harps and with psalteries and with timbrels and with cymbals and with trumpets. And when they came onto the threshing floor of Sidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, wherefore that place is called Parazuzah to this day. I've called this message this morning, There is nothing more important than the presence of the Lord. There is nothing more important than the presence of the Lord. Now, before I get into the message, I want to say this. I trust that you never think just because I'm preaching a subject that I've mastered a subject. Okay? Um, you know, this subject, more than any other subject, is right at the heart of life, living, Christian living. Um, so the preacher has a responsibility simply to relay the voice of God. He's a conduit to the voice of God. So I trust that you never think just because I'm preaching a subject that I'm preaching at you. Brother, sister, this message is for you this morning. This message is for me this morning. This message is for the people of God this morning. Um, so I just want to qualify uh, where I'm going this morning because it's important, especially for our young people. I think when I was a young Christian, I always had the impression that the preacher had all his ducks in a row and all the Christians around me had all their ducks in a row. And then I started to get older and realize we all fall short. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So please know that this morning before we get into this message. If you are not familiar with the meaning and the significance of the different customs, the symbols, the rituals, and the festival, the festivals of Israel's ceremonial system, you will definitely miss a lot of nuggets in the Old Testament. Now, I want you to hear me this morning, just what I'm, uh, what I'm saying. If you ignore these, the meaning of all the, the, the Old Testament um, uh, um, symbols, you'll probably find the Old Testament to be very dry, very burdensome, irrelevant, and even boring. A lot of people don't read the Old Testament. They don't read the Old Testament because they say, well, that was for then, it's nothing to do with us today. And the sad thing is they miss out on so much. But if you see how all these different things pointed Old Testament believers to Christ, It'll bring the Old Testament alive to you. It'll become as alive as the New Testament is. Um, 
I do not have time this morning to go into the meaning of each different aspect of the Old Covenant ceremonial arrangement or the temple design or the furniture in the temple. But I do want to talk this morning about the Ark of the Covenant. It might actually be good um, to start off the message by explaining the Ark of the Covenant is also known as the Ark of the Lord or the Ark of God or the Ark of the Testimony. So if you see these terms, they mean the same thing in the Old Testament. But the Ark of the Covenant was the most sacred religious symbol that the Israelites possessed. There was no symbol that was more important. Um, that is why they kept the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. That's where it belonged. The Hebrew word for Ark means chest. The Ark of the Covenant consisted of a pure gold wooden chest with an elaborate lid um, called the mercy seat. On top of the ark were two golden cherubim angels with their wings overshadowing the lid. Um, it contained two stone tablets with Moses' Ten Commandments on it. Um, also within that little ark was Aaron's rod and also a pot of manna from the wilderness. Um, it had four exterior rings through which the poles could be attached um, for carrying it. No one but the high priest could touch the ark. I said no one but the high priest was allowed to touch the ark. Um, by the way, there was a meaning behind all the symbols of the Ark of the Covenant. And let's just leave it up for a moment, this picture. The mercy seat reminded the Israelites that God had an answer for sin and he had a desire to have a personal, intimate relationship with every one of them. When they looked at this, they saw meaning. It wasn't just some little gold, impressive box that everyone, wow, isn't that beautiful? Once a year, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and he sprinkled blood, blood of a sacrificed animal, innocent blood, upon the mercy seat of the ark to appease the wrath of God or the anger of God against sin. Once a year. The two angels represented and reminded the children of Israel that God protects his people. Amen? Amen. Angels have two purposes. They're messengers, but they're also protectors. And I would say it would under, it, we would be shocked how many times his angels have protected us. His angels have kept guard over us. So many times kept guard over our children, our grandchildren, our parents, our our siblings, whatever. The pot of manna reminded Israel that God provides for his children. God doesn't just protect us, he provides. And I know, as I look around this house this morning, God has met our every need. I didn't say met our every greed. I said he's met our every need according to his riches and glory. The rod of Aaron reminded Israel that God is a supernatural God. So this ark was just not some little, hey, isn't that cute? Or some superstitious religious symbol. This symbol, when they seen it, it they encountered God when they encountered the ark of God. The ark of God represented the powerful act of presence of God in the midst of the children of Israel. Where you find the ark in the Old Testament, you find the cloud of God's glory. Um, wherever you find the ark, God was revealed. Um, 2 Chronicles 6.41 and Psalm 132.8 describes this ark also as the ark of thy strength. The ark of thy strength. 
You just have to study the history of the Ark of the Covenant and it will tell you how special this Ark was. In um, Samuel chapter 1, verse 4, um, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 10 through 11, Israel was attacked by the Philistines and they were decisively defeated. They, the, the Philistines were wiping out the Israelites. Um, this battle was one of the greatest humiliations in Israel's history. And this is what it records. And the Philistines fought and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. There hasn't even been 30,000 footmen killed in Ukraine yet. They estimate that there's been 15,000 Russians killed, Russian soldiers. So this, was, this must have been an incredible slaughter for Israel. This was Israel, the people of God. And it says, the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, who were totally compromised and wicked men, Ab Habni and Phinehas were slain. By the way, when the Ark of the Covenant was taken that day, the presence of God was taken. The glory of God was taken from Israel. You say, well, I think you're kind of taking that a little bit too far. Really? Well, let's read on. 1 Samuel 4, 21 through 22. It says, of course, we see here Eli's daughter-in-law, of course, Eli died. Whenever he got the news, Eli, he was evidently really heavy. And he, it says he fell back and he, he died. Okay. So, but Eli's daughter-in-law had a child right at that moment. And we find in 1 Samuel 4, uh, 21 through 22, she named the child Echabod. Echabod, saying, the glory is departed from Israel. Why? Because the ark of God was taken. This was no small thing, brother, sister. Without the ark of God, Israel was powerless. By the way, without the presence of God, you and me are powerless. We're powerless. We can know everything we need to know about God, about the Bible. But if we don't carry his presence, we are powerless. We're just going through the religious motions. Amen? By the way, do you know what it's like to carry the presence of God? Do you know what that's like? I'm not saying, do you know what it's like to be saved? I'm talking about knowing that God's actually with you. You can feel him. He's in the car. He's in the workplace. He's with you whenever you go to a ball game. You just know his presence. Do you know what that feeling's like? You probably know what happened next in this story. Uh, and the Philistines in 1 Samuel 5, 2, foolishly attempted to bring the sacred symbol of God's presence, the Ark of God, into the heathen house of Dagon. Hey? Remember the story? How foolish are the wicked. However, after this holy representation was placed within this heathen structure, you know what happened? It says, Dagon was fallen flat upon his face before the ark of the Lord. Amen. Isn't that mighty? Huh? Here's their idol. Here's their God. Here's who they worship, who they trust, who they vener venerate. They put the ark of God into his presence, and he's just a dead God. And guess what? He's lying there face down before the presence of God. Isn't that powerful? This tells me that the enemy cannot handle our God. The enemy cannot handle the power of God, the presence of God. And this tells me when Christ comes into a situation, evil must submit. The counterfeit cannot truly survive when God is in our midst. 
light and darkness can never coexist. If God is in this house this morning, there could be 50 witches here, and guess what? They don't stand a chance. If you hear some Sunday that um, 50 witches have just walked into the church, please don't be disturbed. Be, don't be distressed. Just be thankful. Because I can assure you one thing, that their power compared to his power, it's not a competition. That they are going to be more under pressure than you are. Amen? Amen. You can rejoice, exult the name of God, and know that that power is impotent in the presence of our God. God has not changed. Amen? Amen. By the way, this tells us, and there's a lesson for us this morning, that the genuine Christian is out of place in the world. We don't fit in there. The Ark of the Covenant did not belong in the temple of Dagon. You and me do not belong in the world. We don't belong where they um, feel comfortable. But that Ark actually stayed among the Philistines, I believe, for seven months. But do you know what happened? Disease and tumors broke out among all the Philistines. They all had tumors. They were all diseased. And they couldn't wait to get rid of the ark of God. They, they didn't want it. They couldn't handle the presence of God. And I can tell you, the wicked cannot handle the presence of God. Amen? When the ark did come back to Israel... The people of Beth Shemesh received it with joy. But they made a big mistake. They looked inside the ark. They touched the ark. And do you know what happened? God immediately struck down 50,000 and 70 of them. 50,000 of them because they looked inside the ark. After all this, the men of Kerjath Jerem, they took the ark and they took it to the house of Abinadab, where it stayed for 20 years. Through the whole life of Saul, King Saul, it, it, stayed, in, um, it stayed in Abinadab's house. So, Saul had no interest. He had absolutely no interest in the ark of God. Um, what does that tell you? Um, after being made king, and right into our story this morning, when David became king of all Israel, the first thing that he wanted was for the presence of God to return to Israel. David was a smart man. Think about this. David's first concern when he replaced Saul as king, was to return this sacred chest back to Jerusalem. Brother, sister, there's a lesson here for us. There's a challenge here for us. I can tell you there's a challenge for me, for you, not just in this church, but in our homes. We need to see the presence of God back. Amen? David valued the presence of God. Do you? Do you? Do you value the presence of God? Think about this. During Saul's entire reign, the ark had been neglected for years. And it was in this Judean village of Kirath Jerem that this ark sat. By the way, this is all confirmed in our passage this morning in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 3 where David testified, please listen, and let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we inquired not at it in the days of Saul. In Saul's day, it didn't matter. You wonder why Saul's whole ministry or his whole kingship was a mess. Here's the reason. 
You see, the fact that he had no interest in the ark of God was really telling you he had no interest in God. Because he knew what David knew. He knew the importance of this ark. He knew all about it, but he wasn't interested. How about you this morning? Are you interested in the things of God? Is the presence of God something that is important to you? Or is it not? Saul, by the way, is a picture of the flesh. He was always doing his own thing. Whether it was making a ceremonial blood sacrifice when it wasn't his place to do that, or whether it was consulting with a witch, or whether it was persecuting David, Saul thought that he didn't need the presence, the strength, and the counsel of God. How foolish! How foolish was he? As hard as it might be to get your head around it. The reason why David became such a threat to Saul was notably because he carried the presence of God. That was it. It, it says in 1 Samuel 18, 12, and this is a powerful verse, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Instead of getting down on his knees and repenting, Saul decided to torment David, the one who carried God's anointing. This should never have been, brother, sister. Is there someone here this morning that has got so compromised by this world that the Lord has become secondary? You've lost his presence. And as a result, you've lost his blessing. By the way, the, the presence of God brings blessing. That's why we need to fight for it. In his haste and in his excitement, David made a big mistake. He ignored the clear biblical instruction for how the priests should carry the ark upon their shoulders. Instead of that, and instead of these priests carrying the holy ark, David had a new ox cart drawn by four oxen to carry it. Brother, sister, you might say, well, big deal. Like, hello, they're bringing the ark back. God should be happy. Um, it says in, in 1 Chronicles 13, 7, they carried the ark of God in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah drove the cart. According to Numbers 4, though, the Ark of the Covenant was to be removed by no one else but the Levites. What is more, so as not to touch this holy Ark, the priests carried this Ark on their shoulders with poles. So even the priests knew that they were touching the poles, not the Ark. You see, we, we need to realize when God says something, we need to listen. It says in, in Numbers 4.15, The sons of Kohath shall come to bear, but they shall not touch any holy thing lest they die. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath in the tabernacle of the congregation. These priests would have been fully aware of the majesty of the presence of God and how they were required under the law to keep certain stipulations. It goes on to say, And David and all Israel pled before God with all their might, with singing, with harps, with psalteries, timbrels, cymbals, trumpets. They were celebrating. They were so glad to see the ark of the Lord coming back. And when they came onto the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put forth his hand to hold the ark. For the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And he smote him because he put his hand to the ark. And there he died before the Lord. Brother, sister, when this cart wobbled, Uzzah automatically reached out to stop it falling. But in doing so, he touched the holy presence of God. He presumed that he was doing God a favor, but he was immediately killed for his presumption. 
The first thing we see here is this. King David made a big mistake placing the ark on an ox cart. This was not God's way. It was supposed to be carried in a dignified, holy manner. David should have known better. See, please know this. God is a gracious God. I mean, you can read this and honestly, for years I've read it and I'm like, Ugh, that's a bit rough, God. You know, the guy was trying to help. He was just trying to stop this cart falling over. Anybody else ever felt that when they read the story of Usa? But the older I've got and the more that I've learned about the full story, I've realized David should have known better. It started with David, by the way. It didn't start with Uzzah. Uzzah should not have been put in that position. David, in his haste, had the right desire, but the wrong method, and this would be costly. By the way, this also reminds us that God's servants are not perfect. Amen? They make mistakes. They fall short. Brother, sister, I don't care how important you think you are and how you think you've arrived. You fall short. I fall short. We even have the best motives. I truly believe David's motives were pure. I don't believe he was trying to be a wicked man. But this is a lesson to you and me. We need to keep to the blueprint. Amen? There's a lesson also here for each of us this morning. If God gives you instruction, keep to it. Trust Him. He is not making suggestions. He's making commands. Um, he rightly expects you and me to keep to His plan. And I think even in the midst of these things, we learn a lot about God. We learn a lot about ourselves. The lesson from Usa's action is, just because something feels right, doesn't mean it is right. Now, I trust that Usa was a believer, okay? Hopefully someday we're going to meet him in heaven. I'm not one of these preachers because of this. They'll damn Usa to hell. He made a mistake, but... Maybe we would have done the exact same thing. Seriously. So I'm not going to damn Usa to hell for this thing because I'm putting myself and saying, what would I have done whenever the ark's about to fall over? My tendency might have been to try and put my hand to, to, to steady it. So the, I just have this impression whenever we get to heaven. Um, Demas. So many preachers damn Demas to hell. Because it says Demas forsook Paul. Okay, he loved this present world. He had forsook him. And oh, Demas isn't burning in hell today. And I've just this impression as soon as they get to heaven, the first person apart from Jesus to meet is going to be like Demas. They say, hey, you remember that sermon you preached against me? I made it. And they go, how did you make it? And Demas is going to turn around to the preacher and say, how did you make it? Huh? You backslid. You feel God. I went through a season where I turned my back on God. I went into the things of this world, but I came back. And those who damn Uzzah to hell, I think they're going to, like God just being God. Uzzah, hey, welcome to heaven. Good to see you. What's your name? Uzzah. Oh, Uzzah who? Do you remember that guy in the Bible? That's me. How did you make it? You messed up. You died because you... Yes, how did you make it? Many times did you put your hand to the ark, try and steady it? Huh? Brother, sister, we have all, all of us failed, we've stumbled, we've fell short. Amen? Amen. Join the club. And for those who preach sinless perfection, they're preaching a false gospel. They might get a shock where they end up. Because those who say, oh, Lord... Lord, we've done many wonderful things in your name. Oh, Lord, we've done... And he's going to say, away from me, I never knew you. Because it was all about them, not about him. Brother, sister, I trust your salvation is based fully, exclusively, wholly on Jesus Christ. On what he did for you. That's your ticket into heaven, Jesus Christ. Not your own works. 
not how you have ticked all the boxes. If it was like that, brother and sister, we would all fail. By the way, when religion puts up their A to Z, you know what happens? You get the Z and then you've got another A to Z. And then whenever you tick all them boxes, you've got another A to Z. The only problem is we can't keep the A to Z. When you take things into your own hands, you are on dangerous territory. When you refuse to respect God's order and authority, then you place yourself in a position of a rebel. Your intentions can be right, but your actions can be wrong. In Uzzah's case, he thought he was helping, but he was hindering. See, we're living in a day where people are trying to tweak, tweak God's truth in order to fit the mindset of this modern generation. Would you agree? Changing things. Well, I know the Bible says this, but the amount of times I've heard that over this last 20 years, people say, well, I know the Bible says, but, and as soon as they say that, I'm like, here we go. Here we go. We're in for a, a real cracker here. Because when you put a, when you put in a question mark or a plus in the gospel, guess what you get? Another gospel. There's no buts about it. The book is right from cover to cover. Amen. Amen? Amen? Thank God for about four of you. Today, we do not have to or need to have a physical Ark of the Covenant. Amen? The presence of God is no longer limited to the Holy of Holies. We have Jesus Christ today. And you know what he did to that curtain 2,000 years ago that separated the people of God from the presence of God? He ripped it in two. And God stepped out. When Jesus said, it is finished, God stepped out from behind that curtain where the Ark of the Covenant was sitting. And he stepped out to the nations. He went from nation to nation, from village to village, from town to town, from city to city, Revealing his presence to people. Many people have encountered Christ who never even heard a preacher. God revealed himself to a tribe, to a person. The person was crying out, God, God, show forth yourself. God maybe sent an angel. God just sent his presence and they fell to the ground. And most of the testimonies that you will hear like that, do you know the first thing that they did when they encountered him? God, forgive me. That's the first thing when somebody genuinely encounters God, the first thing they realize he is so pure and holy and I am so wicked and vile. That's the sign of a true conversion. See, those who just, hey, they're cool with sin, like, yeah, I love Jesus. And they're continuing on with all their vice, all their sin, and there's no conviction. It's spurious. Their experience is spurious. It's not that we don't sin, but we hate it. And when we get into his presence, we feel convicted. If you're a genuine believer in this house this morning and you're living in sin, you should feel conviction in his presence. Amen? Today, we can personally encounter the presence of God and we can carry the presence of God everywhere we go if we're in the place. How blessed are we today? We don't need to get into an airplane and fly to Jerusalem to encounter the presence of God today. Jesus said as he talked to that woman of Samaria, he says, he, he pointed to the temple, he pointed to the mountain of God. He says, the day is coming. You know, our fathers built here, they worshiped here, but the day is coming where my people will worship me in spirit and in truth. The presence of God is here this morning. Jack, whenever he prayed this morning, the first thing that he, he recognized, Lord, we thank you for your presence. The greatest need we all have as Christians in our day is for the presence of God. 
I think we get so accustomed to living in the, the, like this high speed age. We live, get so stuck in the natural with our earthly cares, the distractions, the entertainment that we feel no need of the presence of God. We're like Saul. We just become neglectful. We're just, life just gets, oh, the, the testimony of everybody today is life is so quick. We're so busy. The cares of this world has got us. It's a bit like the, the, the compromised lettuce in church in Revelation. The last church in Revelation, you know what it said? They had need of nothing. They didn't even need God. They had all their... And by the way, the last church mentioned in Revelation is the Laodicean church. They were rich. They had everything. Brother, sister, we have everything that we need. When was the last time that you had to pray, give us this day our daily bread? You would no bread on the table. When was the last time you had to sincerely pray that prayer? We are so spoiled today, but yet we're so spoiled. We don't even need to say, we need to petition God, say, Lord, we need you. We need your presence. Without your presence, we're done. It's as if we're back with the mindset of Saul that, you know, life is just cool. Are you with me? I believe we live in a day of entitlement. This generation just feels their entitlement, entitled to whatever, whatever's there. They don't have to work for it. They don't have to pay for it. It's just like they're spoiled. They expect everything on a plate. They're not thankful for the least of God's mercies. Maybe we've even arrived there. We just take it all for granted. And then we wonder why society is going downhill. So, the presence of God is felt today wherever Christ is embraced and sin is shunned. The ark points us to Jesus and his earthly assignment, who he was and what he actually fulfilled. Every one of those symbols and things on that ark was pointing us to the Lord. If you've got the Lord today, you've got the ark. And believers can carry the presence of God if they seek him with all their heart. Deuteronomy 4.29 says this, If from thence... Thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, Ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for, for me with all your heart. Brother, sister, are you searching God with all your heart or are you half-hearted? Are you half-hearted in your commitment, in your Focus on Him. It takes real effort to carry the presence of God. It takes dedication. It takes discipline. And as Kyle prayed in the prayer meeting this morning, there's a promise there for us this morning. If we draw nigh to Him, He will draw nigh to us. I can tell you, God keeps His part of the equation. If you want God's presence, draw nigh to him or draw close to him and he will draw close to you. It is the, the presence of God that attracts the anointing of God. Just because you're saved does not mean that you abide in or manifest the presence of God. I'm going to be honest, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. It doesn't matter how much I feel I'm falling short of God. The preeminent thing that I want and I need is in the midst of the battle 
is I need him. It's not just because I'm a preacher. It's because I'm a Christian. I need his presence. I can tell you, like you, I fall short. There's times I can't feel him. I can't feel that tangible sense of his presence. When I don't feel him, I feel lonely, vulnerable, and isolated. How about you? Or is it no problem to you? Since last June, I've never went through such a prolonged battle, unrelenting battle, where I feel like it's a battle every day to experience the presence of God for me. I feel like the devil is standing in between me and God every day. I get up in the morning, it's like a fight. He, the devil's standing there and I can't feel anything. And it's like I have to fight through to get that dirty, vile, stinking devil out of the way so that I can actually breathe and be at peace. How about you? Is things a fight? Or is it just, are you getting things easy at the moment? Don't ask me to explain it. You can fast. You can pray. You can speak in tongues or whatever you feel works. But to me, it seems to be a season where it's a fight. Everything is a fight. There's some seasons where it's just so easy to feel the presence of God. It's just like, I didn't even have to go to church. I didn't need to be around Christians. I just like waking up in the morning and just thank Him. And I felt His presence really strong. I know that the only times that I can feel His presence is when I'm in the Spirit, when I'm sensitive to His voice, when I'm at peace, I'm an, I am at unity with those around me that matter. That's when I can feel His presence. How about you? That takes work. That takes struggle. That takes travail. That takes getting yourself out of the way. I believe that this is what David was talking about in Psalm 51, 11, where he says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. I don't believe, like some people say, he lost his salvation here. He couldn't feel the tangible presence of the Lord. Does that make sense? Because listen to what he says, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He, he, he just, whatever he was going through, it just was a battle. It was a struggle. Like It's like, God, please, don't leave me here. Don't leave me in where I am because it's not, it doesn't feel good. Help me, Lord. By the way, if you're feeling that this morning, I urge you to pray that prayer. Pray that prayer that David prayed. As I come to a close, I've heard people say this. I just don't understand why God would even bless David. Look at what David did. By the way, David didn't do everything right in his life. He did some wicked things. He committed adultery. He also murdered one of his most faithful soldiers. That's, that was out of order big time. I mean, let's be honest. It doesn't matter whether you've murdered 15,000 men or one man, you're still a murderer. How many lies does it take to be a liar? How many things do you need to steal to be a thief? How many people do you need to murder to be a murderer? How many people do you need to fornicate to be a fornicator? And I hear people say, how could God even use David? How could he? I mean, surely... You had your opportunity, you had your blessing, and you messed up. It's over. Is that the way it is? Well, one thing I believe that God was attracted to David was he valued the presence of God. He valued God. If you value the presence of God, you value God. 
There was nothing more important to David. To value the presence of God is to value God. This has to be the, the peak of human existence. So often today, because of our own neglect, selfishness, unbelief, or foolishness, we just push God away. We get so set in our carnal ways. I think a major thing that pushes God away is us constantly ignoring his instruction. God says, I want you to do this. We don't do it. I want you to do that. We don't do it. And after a while, I think God, like a gentleman, just steps back. He just says, that's okay. You don't want me? And he just steps back. Maybe into the shadows. You know, they used to sing of old, standing somewhere in those shadows, I will find Jesus. Anybody remember that? Jan, do you remember that? I forget the, the other word. Do, do you remember it, Barbara? No. Okay. She, she, no, no. Yes. <laughs> she was scared of me bringing her up here to sing it. Barbara, would you sing that for us? <laughs> I wish I could remember all the words. See, he steps back. I believe he just steps back like a gentleman. It's not that he leaves us. It's not that he forsakes us. But he just steps back. He says, I want, I want to be there. I want to be involved in this. I want to lead you, guide you, protect you, provide. You won't let me, so he just steps back. I don't think he's far away, though. You know, a lot of people kind of nearly testify. The only time they feel the presence of God is whenever they're in church around other believers. That's not the way it's meant to be, brother, sister. People say that. I, I, I love to get the church to feel his presence. Well, I believe that you and me can feel his presence outside of church. I, you know, sometimes we make it so complicated. Sometimes it's just being grateful and thankful. I'm not talking about just on Thanksgiving. Okay, even the heathen are thankful on Thanksgiving. Huh? We should be thankful every day. It's, Lord, it's not the way that I kind of want it, but thank you that you're with me. Maybe it's not the way, I don't understand why you're doing this or doing that, but I'm thankful just the fact I've got you. You're with me in the midst of my trial. You're in the boat. And if he's in the boat and he says the boat's going to the other side, guess what? Jesus is not going to sink. I can assure you one thing. He's in the boat. If you're a believer, he's in your boat and the boat is not going to sink. Jesus is not going to sink. So, as I finish, do you know what that's like to be close to him when you're in the midst of a trial? If you don't, I urge you to draw nigh to him this morning. His presence is there for you. His presence is there for me. And I get it. It may be a fight every day. I'm in that season. I'm, I don't always feel him. But I know he's there. When I feel him, he's there. When I obey him, he's there. He's there. But there is times where there's a sense that he, not only is he there, but he's right beside me. I can feel him. I know he's actually, he's there. He's there. He's leading me. He's protecting me. He's giving me words. There's other times I can't sense him. And that's what I say. I feel isolated and vulnerable. And I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about. Let us pray. I believe we're, each one of us that are here this morning, we're meant to be here. I believe God is speaking to us as a people. He's speaking to me. I don't feel worthy to even share this topic. I, I don't, sometimes I just don't feel worthy. I'm like, I, I don't feel like I've got all my ducks in a row on this subject. So who am I to even preach it? And God says, it's not your message, it's my message. It's not about your feelings, it's about my feelings. Well, let's just pray. Let's bring this before the Lord this morning. We are a needy people. We need Him. 
Let's all just pray this morning. Let's talk to him. Oh, God. Lord, we acknowledge this morning our great need of your presence. Lord, we don't need reminder because we know that whenever you're not close, it's just not the same. We, we are not the same. Circumstances are not the same when we're not close to you, Lord. And Lord, we know that you haven't moved. It's, we've moved from you, Lord. You're in the same place, Lord. You're in the right place this morning. But quite often, we just wander like sheep on paths that are of our own making. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Lord, would you return to each one of us this morning like you've never returned before, that we will walk in the presence of God to the degree that even those around us will sense your presence in the workplace, in the schoolroom, wherever we go tomorrow, that you will go before us, that you will be with us, that you will be around us. And Lord, as you present yourself, would you give us the words for others that are hurting, Lord? Lord, we fall short. You never, ever fall short. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for becoming self-sufficient. Forgive us for paddling our own canoe on our own strength. Lord, anyway, when we paddle our own canoe, we just go in circles. The kayak just goes round and round with one paddle and we're going round in circles. When we are paddling our own canoe, that's what happens. Lord, when you're in the boat, there's sails in that boat and the wind is a holy ghost. And that boat can go far. God, please, come close to every person in this house this morning. Wrap your arms around us. And just remind us of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.